Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Brian, and this is the webinar for the American History Exam Review for exam number one. I certainly appreciate everybody spending their afternoon with me. We should be about an hour. We do have some videos and pictures to help you understand the material a little better. That is a picture of me. I am the department chairman at Penn Foster High School. You can email me at brian.brown at pennfoster.edu. I am also on the community, and you can find me on Facebook as well. I do ask that you hold any questions until the end. And when you do have questions, if you could not make them exam questions, we will go over a lot of the material that will help you, though, on the exam. So our objectives for today, we want to gain an understanding of the topics covered in the first lesson for American history. A lot of the information that I'm using you actually already have. When you see on your American history page, need help with exam, we do have these flashcards that I will be using today at the website listed there at http colon forward slash forward slash www.studystack.com forward slash flashcards dash 804-822. I'll give everybody a second to write that down. Okay, so what we're going to do is go through the clues. Okay. These are based on the material on the exam, but they are not the exact questions on the exam. But if you take these clues and then you look in the back of your textbook in the index, you can get a better idea on where you can find them. Also, what I've done is I've incorporated pictures to help understand the concept. And we do have some videos along the way, too, uh, that should help you identify things. Uh, there's been lots of research that shows that when you combine pictures with words, it just helps you learn that much more. So that's what we're here to do today. So the first clue we have is a concept that exhibited 18th century Native Americans did not intend to isolate. And the answer to that clue would be the middle ground. And we are recording this, so don't feel you have to write everything down. And like I said, it is available on the website, these same index cards. Now, to show how what the middle ground means, it means essentially the Indians, they were willing to trade with the, image, the people that were coming to settle in America, you know. So that's what this picture represents. They weren't going anywhere, you know. We, we wanted to find a, a, sort of a, a happy medium for everybody involved and share. Obviously, as we move on through American history, we're going to learn, uh, you know, Americans weren't too kind uh, later on. Okay, I have a student that states they can't hear. Can everybody else hear me? You might want to check your audio. Okay, so everybody, so it's 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 not necessarily. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. So if you can't hear, check your audio. There might be something wrong there. Okay, clue number two is the what we're talking about, the ecological transformation, which involves what is termed as the Columbian Exchange. To get a better idea of that, here's a map that shows, oh, let me go back there. Apologize for that.
So this map shows of, get my pen out here, items coming from Europe and Asia to America, and then items going from America to Europe. I just want to go over a, a couple more things in that slide. I apologize for that. If you notice, there's lots of things, good things that went from, you know, back and forth. We got, you know, fruits, veggies, everything else. And there was also some disease, though, too. You know, smallpox, influenza, measles um, that, that went along back and forth that both countries did not have immunities developed to. Clue number three is the Revenue Act of 1764. And the answer is the Sugar Act. Just an easy way to remember it is taxes, sugar, and one problem that you know everybody would have with taxing sugar, for those who don't know, sugar is a big ingredient in making alcohol. And you know, while, while maybe you know today's age we don't drink as much as back then, back then people did drink quite a bit. And of course, you know, the supply and demand of it, people wanted to buy it. Well, if the taxes were heavy on that, then it would be more expensive. Clue number four, the originator of the Georgia colony. His name was James Oglethorpe. There's a picture of James. And just remember, you know, combine James with the history of Georgia and he was the originator of that colony. Clue number five, powers not delegated to the United States are reserved to the states or the people. Um, and what amendment involves this? Well, it's the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment states that anything not in the Constitution, the states have the right to decide how to operate or make laws for that item. So I hope everybody likes Homer Simpson because Homer, remember the 10th Amendment, states have rights too. You know, he wants to call his home Homerville. It's his right and he wants to sit around in his underwear all day and uh, do whatever he pleases. Um, and there's nothing that states that Homer can't do that, right? So just sort of relating that to the Tenth Amendment. Clue number six, we have the, the question or the clue is sort of a shift to basic crops. And what term is used for that? Well, it's the agricultural revolution. And just in terms of that, just look at, you know, all the varieties of vegetables, fruits, everything that is grown throughout the United States today. Um, you know, but back then it was sort of the, the, the foundations of, of what is grown in, in what areas. We move on to clue number seven, which is the original document that severely limited central power of the United States. The answer is the Articles of Confederation. This was actually our first written sort of constitution, was the Articles of Confederation. Um, and they did not want a strong central government. I mean, we just broke away from the king. You know, the king had all the power. We didn't want that. You know, we wanted states to have their own rights. And to help understand this a little better, I did find a, a sort of a music video. And I hope everybody understands what we're trying to say here and enjoy the music. Let me get it now. Article, 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 article,
government agrees to this. You know this government bond. Each state can do what they want. Because now we're in our new hood. We all work for the common good. It's a beast that we have it on. It became our own nation. So separate we will be now. But we're all on the same team now. Because we got the government. It's our legislative. No need to be judicial or have an executive branch. People in the place will help each other out. They work for the common good. Now, will I am stop that beat now? So, so as you can see, and what the song is is going through is that you know the articles were our first you know written set of laws, but they weren't working so well. So that's why we ended up with the United States Constitution. Clue number eight: We go to what early New England leaders were expected to be part of. You know, what what was expected of them when they became leaders? Well, they are expected to be part of the con a congregational church. Religion was very, very important back then, you know, and it still is today to many people. Uh, you know, of course, one of the things we put in the Constitution in the Bill of Rights is that, you know, people are free to choose their own religion. And if you can see here in the, the meeting house right here, um, it's a church, you know, which sort of makes sense that, a church would be a meeting house if everybody's, the leaders are expected to be part of a church, um, then the where they meet would be um, a church. So clue number nine, uh, what member of Washington's cabinet had a very pessimistic view of human nature? The answer is Alexander Hamilton. Easy way to remember Hamilton, as with easy way to remember lots of things, money, right? Alexander Hamilton on the $10 bill, um, and he was head of the Department of Treasury back in the day, so to speak. And we move on to clue number 10. It, what Puritan leader became the governor of the Massachusetts Bay Colony? His name was John Winthrop. Now, I had a hard time finding pictures of John, but I did find um, a picture of his um, um, gravestone. So John Winthrop right there, um, as you can see, was the first governor of Massachusetts. So it does give you a little visual on what he was and what he meant to the area. Clue number 11, what do we refer to a 50-acre lot in Virginia that didn't cost very much, a little amount of money. It was called a head right. Now, of course, this just goes, this picture, you know, people are farming. Um, you know, if people can get lots of land for a little bit of money, they're going to start coming here. And they did. Um, and there was lots of money to be made. And looking at our next slide, the popularity of tobacco from the early 1600s to the mid-1600s, just like 
I mean, it exploded. And of course, if you're selling more tobacco, you're making more money. And we all know, you know, how much cigarettes cost today. Um, you know, obviously, I don't smoke. I don't promote smoking at all. But the whole philosophy here is they're making money, right, which is still part of the American way to, to be able to make money as people saw fit. Clue number 12, proposed the New Jersey plan to the Constitutional Convention. And, you know, so after the Articles of Confederation, people are like, well, geez, we need representation for every state to be equal. And then people are saying, well, yeah, but what about the bigger states? They should have more representation, you know. So, but as far as who proposed it, it was William Patterson proposed the New Jersey plan. Anybody who lives in New Jersey, there is a Patterson, New Jersey. Uh, you know, obviously named after Mr. Patterson here. Now, we have a video coming up made by um, four students. I don't know what school, but they do an excellent job at showing exactly what compromise needed to be made um, in order to get this nice system we have, this bicameral legislature that we have today. So I'll play the video. It's about three minutes long. I hope you like the Spice Girls. Hey, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. People say in Congress is what I really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. By population is what I really, really want. I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to really, really, really want a great compromise. It's a hot summer day. Feeling this man feel equal in the USA. Got a constitution before my school gal. There was one good issue that they really thought about. Hey, I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. People say in Congress is what I really, really want. I'll tell you what I want, what I really, really want. By population is what I really, really want. If we're gonna, gonna get, get things done, we're gonna, gonna have to agree. By Virginia Square, we're two jerseys. If we're gonna get things done. Okay, so, and, and before I move on to clue 13, so it was so important, you know, they combined each thing, and you've seen the Virginia plan and New Jersey plan. You know, New Jersey being a smaller state, they wanted equal representation. Virginia at the time was a very big state population-wise. Um, they wanted more say, you know, so by making the two houses with one based on the population, 
and one based on equal representation, then it sort of made everybody happy. So that was, um, you know, one of the, the great uh, issues that, that sort of was resolved at the Constitutional Convention to combine those first th those plans. And it's important to note, Virginia, if you look back, you know, the first four or five presidents were all actually from Virginia. So um, just an interesting side note. Now, clue number 13, we move on to form the Committee of Correspondence. Sam Adams. Easy way to remember Sam Adams. His beer. Um, it's not his beer, actually, but it is the name of the brewing company. Um, Sam Adams is there. Uh, and uh, just hope that helps you remember, you know, what he uh, assisted in in the early parts of the country. Clue 14. A French sailor looking for a northwest passage to China. And if you think about it, where France is, if he's going northwest, what's he going to hit? You know, who was it? It was Jacques Carter, Cartier. I'm going to do the French pronunciation. Now, think about this. He ended up on a stamp, a Canadian stamp. So think about it. If he's in France, he's going northwest. Guess what? He hits Canada. Okay, he never did find that Northwest Passage to China, um, you know, but he did find Canada, and he is on the stamp right there. Clue 15, you know, what happened as a result of the federal tax on whiskey? Well, like I, I talked a little bit about before, people weren't too happy with tax on sugar. Whiskey was, you know, along the same lines, the Whiskey Rebellion happened. You know, if you can see this picture, lots of fighting going on here. And if you can see here, I sort of highlighted this area. Liquor store right there, right? Sort of a symbol. You know, they're, they're fighting outside this liquor store. So it sort of gives you a little symbol of what, what's going on there. Okay, clue number 16, we have the conflict that inspired American colonists to expand their influence westward. And it was King George's War. And what had happened was uh, Americans realized, you know, they're fighting for the king. This is before we got our independence, of course, but a pretty tough bunch. And I said, geez, why can't we move westward a little bit, you know, sort of you can think sort of almost, you know, when you're reading between the lines, you can almost see, hey, you know what? Eventually, these, these tough people are going to get their own country. It just, so, you know, King George's War, when it was important, you know, in the, the mid-18th century there. Clue 17. If the 18th century African-American slaves from South Carolina created a blank language, by mixing English and African words. And it could, the thing about American English is we, we're, we have such a combination of many, many different languages. I mean, you know, you have, we have uh, French influences. We have Spanish influences. You know, we have, of course, the British influences. We also have African influences, you know. Um, while slavery was certainly a, a, a horrible, horrible, horrible thing that, that you know, was part of our history, you know, the slaves at the time would create their own words in their own language at the time, and a lot of that had stuck. And what that is is a blended, it's called a blended language. Okay, and we do have a video to show exactly, and we're not going to watch the whole video, but I want you to, we're going to watch about half of it, just to see what type of words and how words came about coming from African Americans, slaves, into the American culture. 
here around the South Carolina Islands. This fella come here yeah. and walk up on the bank and say, what are you doing up on the bank there? And he said, don't you know that my story by many people to be the closest we can get to the kind of language that would have been spoken by the slaves in the 18th and early 19th centuries. Well, that this is the origin of modern Afro-American vernacular. After the dog get off about 50 feet off, and the dog look over there, yeah. and he go on his foot and he look to the foot, and think down, he start hollering, oh, hey, help, help, don't die, Robert. We put together very African words along with Elizabethan English that came out to something that sounded like this show, well, how did they get me to talk like this? So sometimes people think maybe it's English, then they go, but not quite. There were Igbos, Mandinkas, Malinkes, Yorubas, Bolas, Bisi, Afik, Mende, that were all kidnapped, captured, and then isolated together on these islands during enslavement. Once the slaves reached the plantations, they lived in cabins like these beside the main house. Here, many words that came into color from African languages have found their way into standard English. Words such as banana, which comes from the Wolof language spoken in Senegal, and voodoo traceable to an African word for spirit in the language spoken by the Yoruba people. Other African words which have entered sound in English include the animals, zebra, gorilla, and chimpanzee. The musical terms, samba, mambo, banjo, and bongo. And the food and plant names, guga, meaning peanut, yam and gumbo, meaning okra. African compound words were translated, giving English terms like badmouth. And nitty gritty originated as a term for the grit that accumulated in the bilges of slave ships. As well as vocabulary, Gullah employs some grammatical features that differ from standard English. If someone say, oh, no, go ahead and do that, I said, don't do it. Okay? So they ask you, are you going to do it? I already did it. And I did it a long time ago, essentially, <laughs> is what you're saying. I said, don't do it. I done don't do that. You see? So you hear somebody say, I done don't do that. That means they did it, and they did it a long time ago, and why are you asking me? Oh, again, basically. So it's a lot more going into it. So if someone said, well, hold on, they're going over there. Hold on, they're going over there. I haven't done yet of that, but it done do that too. But I didn't grind that, but it ain't did it. Why hold on, they did it? Well, I did it, hold on, they did it. You see? So it's like, when well, you were going over there, yeah, I already went there. But when I went, you weren't there, but I was there. But you're right, I wasn't there when you were there. Phrases like these have a rich and economical expressiveness. In other ways, Gullah and other black Englishes have stripped down their grammar. They drop verbs like is, use don't, where standard English says doesn't, and omit the apostrophe in S that standard English uses as a sign of ownership. Okay, and that's all we're going to do with, with that video, but it just gives you an idea of, you know, the, 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 all the languages that, that blended to form what we have as, as American English now. It is actually very different than than um, the British English. Clue number 18, they contributed heavily to the decline of French and American relations. This is known as the XYZ affair. Um, and at this time, you're, you're going into the, the mid-late 1700s, um, you know, America and, and France, the relationship started deteriorating. And of course, France at that time was going through her own revolutionary process. Um, and, you know, it's known as the XYZ affair, you know, which led America to the Alien and Sedition Acts. America became very paranoid. You know, we, we started, you know, uh, you know, uh, imprisoning, you know, people if we just thought that, you know, they were a spy. So, um, you know, it was uh, certainly a, a, uh, a very paranoid time in American history. Okay, clue number 19, Scrooby separatist sailed for America on the Mayflower. Now, I know it said Scrooby, but to help us understand this a little more, okay, we got the Mayflower, and I got Scooby-Doo. I know it's not Scrooby, but it is Scooby, and I hope that that picture helps you understand that. Clue number 20 yeah, is president who warned against political factions and alliances with countries of no interest. As President Washington said that. And he always thought that if you had more than one political party, you may be um, in for some trouble. And, you know, I, I can't say he was totally wrong, you know, but I think that our party system works. 
because we do we are well represented and you know people could make choices as opposed to just having one political party um, but then again when you look at all the political when you look at the ads and everything there's so much mudslinging going around um, you know everybody thinking that they're the best and everything um, and it usually is based on party lines there but it, it does work for for America for the most part especially when you compare it to other countries um, whose elections are just um, you know, I was barred, you know, seems to be uh, violence and, and everything. Easiest way to remember George Washington, just like Hamilton, he's on the dollar bill. Now, clue number 21. Who led the anti-Catholic sentiment via formation of the Protestant Association? You know, and when you think about, you know, immigrants coming into um, America, you know, um, you know, Religion, like I said, was a big thing. You know, a lot were coming over were Protestant. You know, and, you know, when you think about even today, you know, Ireland still has a very, very difficult time, you know, with, you know, Catholic, Protestant type of, of uh, disagreements going on. The name of that man who led that Protestant association was John Coote. Picture to, to just look at that. You got the Catholics on the ground here, um, you know, with people bombarding them and, and attacking them. Um, you know, not saying Catholics were, you know, uh, perfect throughout history. Um, just to represent this question, that's why I chose this picture. Clue number twenty-two: Who was the most capable general on Washington's staff? It was Nathaniel Green. Okay, got a picture here of a one cent U.S. postage. I'm not sure exactly when this is from, but it shows uh, Washington and Green. Obviously, if they're on the same stamp, there's something that's bonding them together. And, uh, you know, as we've noted, Green was certainly uh, one of the most capable generals on Washington's staff. Now, clue number 23. Practical scientific experimentation was part of the American Enlightenment. Okay, good way to know to, to understand that is to look at this next gentleman. We all know Ben Franklin. You know, you got a kite back there. We're we're looking to get some electricity going there um, somehow. So it, it was a time of, of of trying to understand why things happen. Right, I mean, and we, we certainly do that today. But at this time, you're going back to what, especially when religion was big, everybody tried to rationalize things by saying, oh, well, that was um, something that was meant to happen. You know, if they couldn't explain it, they just, they, they said it was meant to happen. It was, it was a religious reason. At this time, you know, we're looking at the Enlightenment. People start saying, well, geez, maybe there's something in nature that made that happen, something scientific. So how can we, we go about and see exactly why that happened? Obviously, you have the argument, well, you know, nature is all part of God's work, which is certainly, you know, true. I'm not going to argue that. But to understand exactly why it happened, that's where science comes in. Now, clue number 24. Realized tobacco was a very valuable export crop. His name was John Rolfe. And as we looked at, you know, several slides before in Virginia, you know, and the increase in tobacco, well, John Rolfe was a big part of that. Um, and an easy way to remember that is look at this pack of cigarettes. Obviously, you know, you're, you're smoking harm those around you, but there is a John Rolfe brand of, of cigarettes. Um, and uh, that, that's uh, certainly an easy way to remember that. Clue 25, political authority is vested in the citizens of the nation. It's called republicanism. And basically, when you talk about republicanism, it's just that people, you know, when we elect officials, we also have the right to get rid of our officials if we don't like what they're doing. And we do have a short little Disney video. It's about three or four minutes long that I think helps represent, hey, when the leaders start doing things that everybody else doesn't like, we can get rid of them. So let's watch this video um, from... A Bug's Life, I believe this is from. 
I mean, we just got here, and we have more than enough food to get us through the winter, right? Why go back? But there was that ant that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. <laughs> one ant. <laughs> You're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boy, they're puny. Puny? Say, let's pretend this rain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> no. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding me? <laughs> So as you can see, the ants finally just got fed up, and their leader, the leader, the grasshopper, got. So I hope that helps understand what we're talking about for that topic. Clue 26. What spawned American colonists' preference of British goods? You know, by preference, I mean they sort of were, you know, what made them need British goods? It was the Navigation Acts. And what had happened is, is Britain finally said, you know what, um, you know, you have to basically buy British products anymore. How does this relate to a visual? Well, if you look on England and their benefits for the Navigation Acts, you know, kings are making lots of money, you know, they have all kind of food, people are working in the factories, you know, in colonies they're making very little money because they're sending all their money overseas. Um, they have very little food because they have to buy it all from Britain now, and their factories are closing down. Clue 27. Who defeated the German mercenaries at Bennington? His name was Horatio Gates, was the leader of the uh, army that helped fight back the mercenaries, uh, the German mercenaries. And there's a picture of the general himself. Kind of looks like a, a kind of a guy says, hey, don't mess with me, you know, and I think he probably displayed that to his troops and uh, they were very successful. Clue 28. What is the Spanish system that benefited the conquistadors? It was the encomiendas. And to see how exactly this worked, 
as you can see, here's a, a, a Spanish uh, person who came over. He gets the Native Americans to work his land. Of course, he has a whip here, if everybody can see this. You know, so that's how they benefited um, from this is, is they are able to, you know, take advantage of the land and have slaves work for them. 29, the Protestant revivals. This is the Great Awakening. As you can see, there's a revival going on here. Lots of people are all thrilled that they have, uh, you know, the, the religion is, is sort of peaking now, that sort of thing. So get that from that picture. Clue number 30, I believe this is the last one. So we had covered all the topics that you may see on your exam. Um, clue number 30 is about the Intolerable Acts, also known as the Co Coercive Acts. And this, it was sort of the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, you know, that the colonies then got together and said, hey, enough's enough. You know, this was sort of in response. Britain, you know, uh, had responded to the colonists dumping all the tea in Boston Harbor. And they said, well, you know, you got to do this, this, this. And you got to pay all these taxes again. And it just sort of created this, um, you know, very, um, you know, tough snake, in other words, representing all the colonies that, um, you know, once they joined, they were going to win. Yeah, I always uh, list my references, lots of references throughout this showing here. Uh, whenever you do any paper or anything for school, I always do your references. Um, so at this time, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions. I certainly appreciate everybody um, coming to the webinar. We had a very good turnout. I have 40 students here which is um, very, very good. Uh, remember, we have, you know, webinars throughout the months. Usually it's Wednesdays and Thursdays or Wednesdays or Thursdays is when we schedule them. Um, and we do record them and we do put them up on the community. So make sure you join the community. And a lot of times what you can do is from your page, if you have a specific course, if you click uh, meet your instructor, um, Q&A, tips and tools, you'll go to actually, once you're a member of the community, you'll go to that specific page. And if there's um, webinars that we've recorded and put up there, you will see them. So you can watch them at any time. And we are also in the middle of making a YouTube list that we will get out there too. So everything will be all in one nice little package. You can watch any video you want. Um, so I certainly appreciate everybody coming. So at this time, I'll open it up to questions. Um, like I said, just refrain from asking me exam questions. I can't answer those. but. I'll be certainly happy to answer anything else.